please uh, give us the uh, current situation in terms of price in the silver market, um, what you might see over the short term um, as it unfolds uh, over the next six to 12 months? What, what, what is your forecast? Sure. Uh, well, Patrick, I take a longer term view than six to 12 months. I've been involved with silver for, well, probably almost 10 years now. And of course, the price of silver has done wonderful things in that time period, even though recently it's come under a lot of pressure. Uh, my thesis has been that even though the last decade was the decade for gold, that this decade will be the decade for silver. I've always imagined that it will go back to its historical relationship to gold of 16 to 1 in terms of price. And as an example, with gold at 1600 would suggest that the silver price should be $100. And most of the data that I look at, it, certainly as it pertains to what's happening in day-to-day -day markets today, and don't mean the COMEX market when I talk about that, I talk about the physical market for silver. We have data points that uh, suggest the buying for silver uh, by the public is almost on a ratio of one to one in terms of dollars of silver being bought versus dollars of gold being bought. We can see that in the U.S. Mon US Mint's uh, data that comes out every month and, and pretty well almost every day. Uh, so, for example, last month, uh, the amount of silver coins bought through the Mint service, they sold 50 times the number of silver coins as gold coins. Uh, this month, it's actually running at about 70 to 1, uh, which really means people are putting as many dollars into silver as they're putting into gold. But there's nowhere near the amount of silver available to invest in as there is gold that's available to invest in. So what do you attribute this correction that we saw recently and the correction that we saw at the end of April. Sure. Well, I think both corrections were orchestrated by the people who are massively short silver. Uh, when the price went from 20 to 50, roughly, I mean, those shorts had lost about $20 billion. If silver had broken through $50, it just would have gone absolutely crazy because it would have, like gold, when gold went through 850, I mean, it doubled shortly thereafter which would have created great stress on those people who are short. And unfortunately, in the COMEX market, which is mostly a paper market, those who have huge amounts of uh, money can force a price down. And as you may recall, Patrick, there was a, a Sunday night at 9.30 when the price went down $6.13. And it's minutes. usually over the weekend that this happens. When nobody was trading it. And mm -hmm. then that particular day, the Chinese market was closed for the day. The UK was going to be closed that day. And of course, everyone comes into work at New York time and the price of silver is down $6. They already have a margin call. And then the CME raised margins four times in the next week, which just put the, the uh, long holders of silver contracts under tremendous duress and they had to sell out. So a lot of the, uh, the short position has been covered here. Uh, I, I'm not saying that there won't be further rates. I mean, there was a rate recently when they knocked it down to $27. Um, and, but that's what happens in the paper markets. And the paper markets can trade up to a billion ounces a day, but we only produce 900 million ounces in a year. And looking at the physical market, which I spend most of my time looking at, it, I can identify something like a 380 million ounce change in supply demand just over the last uh, five years in a 900 million ounce market. And so I have to believe that sooner or later we're gonna run into a shortage of physical silver and the physical silver price will then determine the COMEX price. I think uh, a lot of people would want to know how soon do you foresee potentially this uh, change taking place? <laughs> well, that's a very <laughs> tough question to answer because there are forces at work every day, right? And um, you have to exhaust those forces or they have to have some reason to change their view on, on what's their best interest in the paper markets. Um, I've always imagined or hoped that uh, some industrial user of silver says, oh, I can't get the silver and the word gets out, there's a, there's a physical shortage. And or people just continue to buy it at the rate they're buying it because you can't keep buying silver on a one-to-one -one ratio to gold and have the price be 50 to one. That is mathematically impossible. I know that you, uh, you like silver very much, but uh, let's talk about gold for a minute. And uh, uh, please tell me your opinion about uh, Venezuela, Chavez, repatriating the gold sure. that uh, they had on deposit with uh, 
with uh, English banks. Sure. Uh, is this possibly or potentially the beginning of a new trend in terms of realizing uh, uh, real inventories uh, of gold uh, by uh, some of the specific uh, countries or, or institutions? Sure. Well, I think it's one step in the process. Uh, one other thing that's happened is we've now seen that central banks are buying gold, which they used to be sellers of physical gold. Now they're buyers of physical gold. The GFMS this year suggested that uh, central banks might buy as many as 500 tons of gold whereas they were sellers last year. And this is in a 4,000 ton a year market. And I think Venezuela's statement is, we want to have our physical gold in our physical possession. Is it going to make a difference? I can't tell you the answer yet because, of course, uh, Venezuela doesn't have their gold yet. And I'm surprised that it's taken, uh, theoretically, until the middle of November for them to get their gold. Because if it was on deposit, you wouldn't think the logistics of transferring that amount of gold, I think it's, what is it, 93 tons or 110 tons, that's not a lot of gold as in terms of physical sizes, right, because it's so dense. Um, so we'll see whether they get their gold or not. You, you experienced uh, the same kind of reaction, I believe, when you uh, recently wanted to purchase some silver, where, where it took uh, a little longer than, than what uh, one would think would be uh, right. normal. Well, we, when we started the Silver Trust, we had to go into the market and buy 15 million ounces. This is about exactly a year ago. And 15 million ounces at the time, and probably uh, $20, so it's like 300 million worth of silver, which is not a lot of silver. And you would think, you know, people advertise that there's a billion ounces of silver around and you want to buy 15, you'd think you could get pretty speedy delivery. It took us three months to get the silver, and some of that silver that was delivered to us was manufactured after we'd made the purchase agreement, which really means, or in my mind, there wasn't a tremendous amount of silver lying around waiting to be delivered. So there, there, there could be uh, the possibility that we may have a lot less inventories than what appears to be told um, on these government reports or... Sure. Well, even, nobody really knows how much inventory there is. I mean, we know how much is in COMEX, uh, we know how much the SLV owns, but theoretically that shouldn't be available. Um, beyond that, I just don't believe there's huge amounts of silver around. We buy, we're buyers of silver every day. Um, we're very often delayed on our shipments and, uh, you know, we could go in and buy, you know, two or three hundred thousand ounces and we sort of get the comment, well, that shipment's going to take two or three weeks, which really means there's, I don't think there's any ready silver inventory that's just waiting for someone to say, okay, fine, I'm going to buy it, we'll deliver it to you, because it's not that difficult to deliver silver. Let's talk about a little bit uh, about the European crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the banking crisis. How do you uh, see that uh, affecting the uh, silver price uh, short term and immediate sure. um, or even long term? Sure. Well, I think, Patrick, it depends how it gets resolved. I mean, if it gets resolved by just simply printing money, uh, I would think it would be incredibly positive for gold and silver because people would realize that fiat currencies are being debased through those actions. Um, I think the fact that gold and silver are where they are is very much uh, a, a result of people more and more realizing that the, the, the powers that be seem to care less about how much they print. And therefore, if that's the solution that we just print, I think it'd be very optimistic. Uh, well, but there's one other choice. The other choice is they don't solve the problem, which as you know has become a banking problem. And if there was a banking problem that erupted, it could be even more positive to silver because then people realize, well, I shouldn't have, if I can't have my money in a bank, what are my choices? And as we all know, it's very, very limited. And most of us who are believers in silver and gold believe in the fact that we don't want to have a counterparty and we'd much rather own the physical, that we're not reliant on someone else fulfilling a promise. According to Arabian Money, they uh, commented that the Arabian banks have isolated themselves from what they believe to be an economic crash of the Western world. How do they fit into this equation in terms of the demand for the precious metals? I don't have a lot of data on Arabian banks. I, I truly don't. I mean, we watch the gold sales in uh, Dubai and places like that, and we're very aware that the Arabs, the whole Arabian community, is a believer in gold, and they like trading physical things for physical things. 
uh, but I, I must confess I, I'm not enough of a student of what's actually happening in that area to tell you one way or another what the flows are. We did see a data point about a year ago where all of a sudden Saudi Arabia just said, oh, our reserves were supposed to be this, but they're really 60% higher, and it came out of nowhere. I mean, I would certainly imagine if I was there and I was selling goods to the world, I might uh, very well want to have my, uh, my cash invested in silver and or gold. I'm going to uh, ask you to stick your neck out here and uh, try to uh, do some kind of a forecast for our audience. Uh, what do you uh, 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 see, um, I would say, let's say, uh, within uh, uh, 2012, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, demand picture, um, the uh, uh, crisis uh, in Europe, and essentially um, uh, trying to resolve this issue and finding some kind of resolution. Um, if these um, uh, leaders, uh, the world leaders, economic world leaders, are able to uh, come uh, and put together uh, an intelligent plan, um, what do you feel the price of silver uh, sure. could do? <laughs> well, I, I have to beg to differ with the word intelligent plan <laughs> because I don't think there is an intelligent plan. In fact, I think we all now know that most plans have not worked and, and, and created a very difficult situation for the average person in the world and have, have exacerbated the problem in the banking world. So uh, they're going to come up with a plan. It won't be an intelligent plan. I don't think solving a debt problem is solved by creating more debt and leveraging it, which is what's been discussed in Europe today. Uh, but either way, as I said before, I think that uh, the impetus will be for precious metal prices to rise. If I had to predict, I certainly would believe that silver would be above $50 next year and that uh, gold certainly will be above 2000 And it could be substantially higher than that. It's a, it's a question of how irresponsible governments are. And, you know, maybe we'll find out that there's a European plan. And then three or four months later, there's an American plan where we get QE3. And it's hard to know where it's going to go because you don't know how irresponsible the governments are going to be. But they t are tending to be irresponsible. Therefore, you would think there would be uh, lots of impetus for higher prices. Eric, I want to thank you once again for taking uh, this time to spend with us and answer some, some of these questions for our audience. Thank you so very much.